It's, it's only now that we've got things like continuous delivery, building on the, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Some of them actually are giants. I don't, how tall are you, Dave? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that's an aside. Standing on the shoulders of giants, um, the DevOps movement linking up um, operations with the software development with our business, that this has become uh, a feasible approach to building software. Dan North hates microservices. He says it should be called this. Unfortunately, when Martin Fowler names something, it tends to stay very, very named. So we're stuck with microservices. But this is, he makes a good point, Dan. You know, this is about replaceable pieces in your architecture with the external uh, behavior remaining the same. So if you think about Netflix, I mean, I don't know if you read the Netflix developer blogs, it must be once a week they completely rewrite their entire platform. You never notice any difference on your smart TV when you use your interface when you're streaming video, right? But they've moved from Scala back to Java, from Java, uh, just kind of normal kind of OO style, sorry, RPC style um, uh, calls to external services to reactive calls to services. They hired Eric Meyer to come in and port RX from C Sharp into RX Java. You don't notice what's going on behind, in, so you don't notice what's going on inside the organization because the external behavior is remaining the same. This is my family's axe. And why do we care about this, right? Well, who works in sort of big companies here? Who would say big organizations, big government, that kind of thing? Put your hands up. OK, so some startups. Some, cool. Maybe some of this will, uh, will resonate. We'll see. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit. And bearing in mind, I've got about 400 slides to get through. So. I'll probably have to do this quite quickly. But if we go back to 2004, this is really where the story starts and why this future is looking so scary, right? So this is an exit of an email Jeff Bezos sent around Amazon when he realized some of the issues they were having with their technology was not, was, was um, meant that they could not scale as fast as, as they wanted. And the important part here is in bold, I appreciate it might be difficult to read, I'll read it out. It's essentially saying communicate through APIs, make everything externalizable, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And the mandate closed with anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Thank you. Have a nice day. It's from the CEO down, right? And he's famously a very, fairly controlling individual. But this is, this is the message that was coming from the CEO down back in 2004 at Amazon. And over the next decade or so, they completely transformed the way they work internally. They moved away from big database, big web app, to lots of much smaller uh, more fine-grained services communicating via very well-defined externalizable interfaces. Right? So this is the kind of start, and from that came AWS, because they needed a way of supporting their own teams building the systems this way. I know what you're thinking. That's great. That's Amazon in 2004. And this is what everyone else thought, right? Everyone else thought, hey, this is great. Unicorns breathing fire, cats, pistols, rainbows, whatever, right? Except some time passed, and turns out, other people started doing this as well, right? So, you know, just some small companies, I don't know if you've heard of any of these, they started following the same approach. Why? Because they were gaining a competitive advantage in their marketplace, right? That's why they started following this approach. It gave them some other benefits, which I'll talk about in a sec, but essentially that's why. So I guess what I'm saying is these companies started to do things differently, right? They're building software that, that they're able to deploy on demand, built out of these small independent components, microservices. They can scale teams. One of the great benefits is Mythical Man Month. We all know what happens when you add another 30 developers onto a, a team, right? What happens? We go faster, right? Right? But actually, you can scale if you've broken your applications or your architecture up into smaller components. You can scale teams around the individual components, not by adding 30 people, but you can certainly scale by adding you know, a few more here and a few more here. You get more breadth. You increase the surface area in which you can work. And you know, given some of the examples, they can obviously operate at web scale. That's where the term web scale came from in the majority of cases, which is fine. But if you're not in that land, why should you care? So this is something I quite like. It's one of my American colleagues showed me this recently. This is something that's been called the, um, the innovation gap. Right? So if you're in a, a large organization working in traditional ways, your, your ability to adopt new technologies, new practices, better ways of working increases pretty slowly. But if you're in startup land or in one of these sort of, uh, I guess, more modern, I'm going to say, organizations, the ability that you get to adopt these new things is just rapidly increases. 
So you get this gap over time between big organizations and startups or st former startups where big enterprises are just lagging behind faster and faster. Now the question is, you know, if you're a big bank, what do you do, right? Because you're following this path and you know that there's gonna be startups coming to steal your market share. Even in finance, this is happening. In insurance, this is happening. It's, this is not, you know, Ubers and et cetera. This is big established industries are hitting this problem. What do you do? Well, you can say, okay, well, maybe we'll do something now, or we'll, maybe we'll wait two years and see what happens. But in two years' time, this gap is massively greater, right? So you're playing catch up again. So this is the problem, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why the future is pretty scary. If you're in a big established company, in a big established market, as I say, it's pretty scary. Now, I did mention this idea of competitive advantage going as fast as possible, say, fast as possible. You should be able to go as fast as possible using some of these practices and patterns, right? Microservices, continuous delivery, lean enterprise, moving towards service thinking away from project thinking. You should be able to build this software that's cheap to replace, yada, yada, yada. And this is a quote from Adrian Cockcroft. This is why Netflix builds systems out of fine-grained services, because it allows them to go as fast as possible. This is what we want to be doing, right? with reference to earlier, with obviously um, massively, uh, a massive focus on acceptable quality for the particular vertical industry sector that you're in. I don't want to, you know, Ariane, etc. But we, we want to be able to go as fast as possible. So, that sounds great. But s as soon as you start on this journey, even if you are adopting better practices, continuous delivery, um, kind of lean software engineering, lean product development and so on, you start running into problems. So here's a, here's a thought experiment for you. This is time for a thought experiment. So consider we have a service, right? This is a web application, big, sort of normal, standard, monolithic web application. We'll call it A for the sake of argument. And, you know, we've adopted continuous delivery, so we've got this fantastic automated pipeline that can get us from typing in code, committing into our vision control system, into production. Right? And it's automated, we can do it on demand. And this is not a release train, we do it every week or we do it every day even. It's when we want to release a new feature, when it's ready to, and when we can get business value from it, we can press a button, it'll go out. We don't have to wait for the next train to come. Right, so this might look something like this. This is a pretty standard build pipeline. Um, you know, you've got sort of compile, you know, functional tests, acceptance tests, integration tests, and deploying into production. Everyone's happy so far. We happy at the back? Just, you know, I have to get acceptance from, you know. Um, this is pretty standard stuff, right? And, you know, we tap it tap, we touch some code, we commit into vision control, and our software moves smoothly into production. Now, to illustrate some of the things you start running into, actually first order issues with building microservice uh, architectures, how many environments, say, do we need to integrate with this, right, or to integrate this software? And this is a trivial case, presumably, because we've got one application, right? So, pretty much we need one environment, production. We don't have to run integration tests. I'm ignoring the fact that, yes, you'd probably want to go through user acceptance testing, and there might be a stage to do that. Might be a stage to do performance testing. But essentially, you've got commit, go through your pipeline, tests get executed automatically, we can deploy on demand into production. Sweet. We know things work, because we've got this nice feedback loop. So let's develop the thought experiment a bit more. We're hipsters, right? So we're going to have not one. We're going to split this application up into two different services. We're going to have microservices. And we'll call them A and B. Well, let's call them web app and customer. It's probably uh, a bit more meaningful. And crucially, these things are going to have a dependency on each other. One thing depends on maybe some state or behavior in the other. So how do we make sure, given this just simple two application system, that these things work well together? That's, that's the question. And there's a number of different answers to this. And I'm going to sort of illustrate some of these. So the first thing you might do is have some kind of fan in, right? We'll have independent pipelines. What we're going to say is, and this is the kind of classic integration testing environment stuff, we're going to fan in, deploy these things into an integration testing environment, and we'll run some tests. It'll be auto automatically run these tests, and then we'll promote stuff, uh, promote, uh, code into production. So, fantastic. This sounds on the surface like a great idea. 
oh, I should point out V1 and V1 here. These are the currently deployed production pieces of code, right? The production versions. So, you know, tappy tap. For those of you, that's, that's the only code. Does that count as code? <laughs> I don't know, I'm trying, I'm trying. Anyway, if it's, you know, tap your tap, I'm gonna commit some code, some changes, and I'm gonna create version two of my uh, first web app, of the, of the web app. And that's gonna be pushed through uh, my build pipeline, it's gonna hit the integration environment, gotta love that animation. It's gonna be tested and then promoted into production. Fantastic, right? But what do you test that application against? Right, how do you ensure that the, the version of the application that gets into production is tested against a valid, uh, a valid version of the second application. This is where it starts to get a bit tricky, right? I might start talking fast because it's the only way to, I can think of to get through this fast because it, the permutations are almost endless, right? Now, you would think it would be sensible. What we'll do is we've, we know we've got a production version thing, right? We need to test whether our application works against it. So we'll have an integration environment with our production version of the code in version one, right? Cool. And we'll run some tests against that. So does my web app work with the production version of my customer service? Sweet. That's what we'll do. Yeah, and then you've got this issue with people working on the same code base at the same time. So I'm working on the web app. Jim is working on uh, the customer service. Right, maybe we're sitting next together, maybe we're not, maybe we're on different continents. Tappity tappity tap, git commit, uh, git push origin master, and all of a sudden, we're into this weird indeterminate state. Right, so both of these things get pushed through our build pipelines. They both hit our integration environment. They get tested against each other, against version one and version one, and they get pushed into production. Sounds fine, kind of. Unfortunately, we're hitting this kind of race condition between these two services, right? Should version one of one service be tested against uh, version two of another, or version one against the snapshot, or version one against... Well, I can't even... I don't even understand how to um, describe this without another photo, or another, another image. So this is our build pipeline. So apparently, this is, this, is, this is a type of breakdancing called locking. Who knew? Uh, so this is locking. Essentially, we've got a lock happening in our integration test, in our integration environment, where we're uh, either overwriting uh, versions of the application um, or, we're, uh, or we're having to delay uh, committing on one branch or one pipeline until the other pipeline's gone through. There's essentially a lock here. And as we all know, locks equals delay, right? Any time you, you put a lock into a system, you're going to slow stuff down. Essentially, there's... Someone's going to have to have the build hack to say, I'm committing now. Can you wait until uh, I've committed and I've pushed and it's in production until... Right, so that's one option, right? We can just test against production versions. The Peter Drucker quote, there's nothing so uh, useless as doing efficiently that which should be not be done at all. There's another option, right? So what we could say is, okay, we'll have integration environments for each of these applications for both the production versions and the snapshot versions are you, are you still with me? I'm not even with myself. This is getting really complicated. Look at the state of this tree. You could, I really wanted to animate this so it actually turned on its side and walked off. It's starting to get kind of fractal. And where I've got ticks here, this is the number of integration environments you need to support snapshot versions of each one and test against production version of each one. So we've got four. We've got two services of four different integration environments. But that's all right, okay? That's fine. Because Amazon because Amazon sorts this out. Amazon makes this all work. We, I think we blipped on the tech radar last time, Phoenix environments. You might have come across Phoenix servers. A Phoenix server is, a, is a, it's a, essentially an append-only uh, append infrastructure. So you create your server, you deploy it with a piece of software on it, and you never update it. You only delete it and deploy a new one. Same with Phoenix environments. You don't just deploy servers, you deploy entire environments. And you can script that. We can use things like Ansible, and that's awesome. And we can actually easily create as many integration environments as we want. So we're in this point, right? We've got locking, so introducing delays into the, into the, into the software development process. Or we've got using Amazon to spin up lots of different integration environments so we can test permutations of our code against one another. And Amazon is fine until, right, until 
you get the monthly bill. Because it's not free. All right? Amazon is not free. Amazon costs money. So we're sort of saying, right, with two services, potentially you could use maybe four integration environments or have this delay introduced by locking. What happens if you're slightly bigger than that? What happens if you move to, say, four services? Right? What happens if you're Netflix and you're 600 plus services? I think, um, who was I talking to? PayPal, they're, I think they're over 1,000. How do you scale microservices in terms of deploying them, in terms of on demand, pushing a button, getting them out into production without essentially um, giving Amazon all your money? Or slowing down to the point where you're in this, it's almost like a dis distributed monolith where everything is deployed in lockstep together. That's the question, really. And it's interesting, I mean, this is, this is Adrian from Netflix. That's one of his quotes. We have to use Europe for UAT, right? Because they can't do this. It's impossible for them to do this. Even though they use so much infrastructure from Amazon that Adrian has got his own lifetime free Amazon account. I'll let that sink in. He can use any resources forever on AWS for free. That's how much stuff Netflix uses. But they're so big, they have to use Europe to UAT. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking, that's quite a hard problem. Bugger, <laughs> essentially. Um, I should probably come up and try and think about whether there's an approach that we can use to solve this. But it got me thinking about other stuff as well. Like We integrate our software. We write integration tests. We write user acceptance tests. We do all this stuff, right? End-to-end -end tests across our entire system, product-level testing. So suddenly, the aim, you know, with the aim of building stuff that's independently deployable, testable, scalable, we've suddenly created this problem for ourselves. What does that mean for the rest of the tools and techniques and practices we've got? And that's what the rest of the talk is about. Should be all right. I've got about 15 minutes, and I've got another 200 slides. So, as I was saying, I was thinking, so if, you know, we've got this, maybe an issue with end-to-end -end testing there. We've got maybe an issue with independent deployment and service version and evolution, this stuff is hard now. Actually, it becomes really hard. What about all this other stuff, right? What about things like these? Because this is stuff we just take for granted. Some of them are design practices. Some of them are just better practice. Some of them are you know, whole swathes of different types of practice. Um, World of Warcraft is just in there, because you know, why not? What does it mean for all these other things? Well, I, I'm just sort of thinking again. Maybe we could take a look at some of them. I can't talk about World of Warcraft too much, because um, I'd be here all day, frankly. Um, but we'll start with YAGNI. So YAGNI stands for you aren't going to need it. All right? This is a key tenant uh, in ThoughtWorks. Probably the first thing any developer said to me when I joined the company was, uh, and saw me writing code, was, nah, you aren't going to need it. YAGNI, mate. All right? Write your test first. You don't need that. Get rid of it. Yeah. YAGNI, you aren't going to need it. What does that mean in terms of microservices? Is it still applicable? Well, in one sense, you could kind of say premature optimization. Why are we splitting all these things up? All right? You aren't going to need to do that. Let's build this big thing. All right? Start with a big thing. Don't split things up. You aren't going to need it. But I tend to think of it in a se slightly separate way. I tend to think of it as build out services when you need them. So you know, if we've got one big application, maybe composed of some, uh, sorry, one uh, sort of in, in, one Yes, so one application composed of some bounded contexts, which are composed of some, some microservices. What I'm, what, I'm what I'm saying is, you don't, using, if you follow emergent design practices, you don't have to design and think about all the microservices in your system up front. Yagni, you aren't going to need it. But what you can do is build out the services as you go. As you learn more about the domain, about the problem you're trying to solve, you can build out these services as you go. So I think, actually, you know, Yagni kind of still has a place. Definitely for me, you know, when building out these architectures. It's just chunked up a level to the level of systems architecture rather than actually in the code itself. So that's the first thing. Build out services as you need them. The next, the next thing is a subset of GRASP, right? So GRASP, General Responsibility Assignment in Software Patterns. Uh, Craig Larman came up with this. These are almost like the first patterns. So this is things like Information Expert, for example. Cohesion and coupling come from the GRASP patterns. What does that mean in terms of building out microservices. If we chunk up to the level of the systems architecture, again, this is now where we're starting to see people really take on you know, widespread adoption of things like event-driven architectures and messaging. 
and moving away in lot, lots of cases and reactive, moving away from RPC, essentially remote uh, procedure calls between, between services. Right? Because if you do this, if you start passing messages about or raising domain events in domain-driven design terms, you get these properties. You keep these properties of high cohesion that we want within services and low coupling between services. So starting to use things like uh, event-driven architectures to implement microservices has become, uh, I think is why it's um, becoming more popular. The next thing, dry, don't repeat yourself. So this is the definition, or the, the one I could find anyway. This is from Dave Thomas, Prag Dave. Every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within the system. This is good, single reason to change, related to the single responsibility principle. It also means, uh, it also means that you're kind of optimizing in a lot of ways for reuse. Right? If we've got, uh, if, if we keep our code dry, if we have a single representative place, in, in our code, then we can reuse that in other places. So what does that mean, though, when we've got microservices? If we've got a user in one place and a user in the other place, surely we should have a common representation of that, right? We should have a common user, common customer, potentially. So maybe what we should do is extract that into some you know, binary that we can include in all of our different microservices. That would be dry, wouldn't it? Right? That would be a single, uh, unambiguous, authoritative representation of a user within our system. Except you start running into all sorts of problems. As soon as you introduce binary dependencies across systems, you start locking their chain cycles to that of the binary dependency. If I'm over here in the customer service and I want to make a change to the user, um, I can make the change. But then I have to share that binary with the web app, who also has to make the change and deploy. You start getting into this kind of uh, WSDL early binding, Jax B style nightmare. So what does that mean for services? Dry, does dry not apply? Well, I think it does. I think we should follow the dry principle. We should say dry within services. So we should avoid duplication within services. I think the phrase is damp across them, right? So we actually embrace duplication of code across services. Okay, it's not as simple as that, but talk to me afterwards. I haven't got time to go into the rest of it. Essentially, this is what I'm saying. And if that means you have a different, you have a, a user class in one place or a user function, a function that creates a user in one place and in another place, that's fine, okay? Because one of the things we have learned is these services will diverge over time. They will change at different rates, right? And we want that. We want users in one place to be decoupled from users in another place. So, test-driven development. This is a big one. People come across this book. Hands up who've, who's read this. This is, I think, for me, I'm not sure if other people would agree, but this, this for me is one of, the most in, one of the most important pieces of writing about how to deliver software in, in years. Um, continuous delivery was another one. This is certainly up there. Because it describes what Mike Feathers calls the London School of Test Driven Development, how you drive out your code, um, how, how tests, how writing tests first drives out code that is effectively well designed, easily testable. If you haven't read it, go and get it. It's really, really good. But there's been a lot of buzz recently about this thing about tests, right? Should we be writing tests? Should we bother writing tests? And there's another interesting twist with microservices, which is, oh, wrong way, sorry about that. Should we bother writing tests if we're going to throw this away? One of the aims, right, is to, is to create my family's acts, is to, re, is to create systems composed of replaceable parts. Writing tests costs money, essentially, right? It actually costs you money because you're spending time, expending effort doing it. So should we expend effort doing that when we can just throw this stuff away and rebuild it? So there's all sorts of theory about this. I don't know if, if you've come across, this is my theory anyway, about why this debate is happening. If people have come across the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition before, this is one of my pet topics. The Dre this, is, this is essentially a um, uh, sort of behavioral model developed by a pair, uh, some, uh, two brothers, Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus in the US some decades ago to describe how people acquire skills over time. So any skill, including describe the skill of describing the Dreyfus model, you start at beginner. 
right? You start off not really understanding or, or knowing what to do. And at the bottom, competent, advanced, beginner, and novice, essentially everything has to be rules driven. So if you think about learning to drive a car, right? The, the driving instructor says, right, do this, do that, do this. You come up to a corner, he says, or she says, okay, now decelerate, okay, indicate. You follow a set of rules in order to learn how to turn a corner in a car. But if you think about a Formula One driver approaching a corner at 150 miles an hour plus, they don't go through that kind of very deliberate, I guess it would be the slow thinking thing, the deliberate thinking about what to do next. They've moved up the Dreyfus model into expertise. And expertise is characterized by intuitive thinking, by fast thinking, if you like. It's, in, it's, it's, it's that, I know when to turn, I will do it now. It's the, the Andy Murray, I just know how to, to do this stuff, as we heard earlier. And this is, this is, I think, for me, one of the reasons that we start hearing about tests and test-driven development, and oh, we shouldn't do this anymore. Because I think a lot of people who, who are sort of talking about this stuff are sitting up here, right? They're sitting up as experts. Now, I've been learning, I'm still learning how to do TDD. And I know, even if I don't test drive my code, my code ends up looking a certain way. I've probably spent 12 years test driving my code, and my code looks small classes, very small methods, everything is injected, I have no getters and setters. It's, that's how my code looks. And I think if you see people writing code who are sitting up here with TDD, that's what their, their code would look like. They get the benefits, in some cases, of testable code, of being able to compose things rather than et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's a bit theoretical, isn't it? Sorry about that, I might have lost you. So thanks to Alan Kelly, we came up with a very simple flow chart which describes whether you should test drive your code. So at the start, this is the, this is the question you ask yourself, am I Kent Beck? All right, that's the first question you ask. And if the answer is yes, you do, do what you think is best. The next one is, am I Dan North? All right. I've seen Dan North's <laughs> Me too. Um, am I Dan North? Again, if you're Dan North, you do what you think is best. All right. But if the answer is no to those questions, then just fucking use TDD. It's, it's a really obvious thing, right? Use it. Use test-driven development. So thanks to Alan. <laughs> So, and, I mean, for, and for many reasons that we can go into, but um, you know, the other patterns and um, tools and better practices I've talked about, grasp, seeing responsibility, these sorts of things, KISS, actually you get a lot, of that, a lot of that stuff for free if you test drive your code. It makes a lot of the, these things so much easier from a design perspective, and that's actually how I really value it. So, should we write unit tests? And I think it, we should, if only for the reason that you get all this other stuff as well as the quality, as well as everything else. So I'll whip through a couple more of these. Single responsibility principle, SRP. So I think the technical definition of this is that your code, single piece of code, should have a single reason to change. That's the full definition of single res responsibility principle. Um, that was again related to, the, uh, to dry earlier. SRP from the solid principles. Um, there is a, uh, has been a meme for a while, which is, there's a, an alternate definition that I came up with, actually whilst writing code with Dan North, Dave, <laughs> which is that code should be no bigger than my head. People have come across this idea before. So this is a former colleague of mine, Alistair, working at Neo4j, and he's measuring some of the code in the Neo code base to work out whether it's following the single responsibility principle there. Because essentially, if you hold your head up to the, to the monitor, that's how big classes should be, all right? But there's another kind of, I guess, more serious point, really, which is around abstraction and about how much you can actually keep in your head at once. So when I say code, you know, an object should be no bigger than my head, really what I mean is, I mean, yes, you can do that, but I should be able to understand all of it. I should be able to understand an object or a function in its entirety, right? I should be able to keep it in my head. And I think that's true as you chunk up to the level of systems of systems. You should be able to keep each level of abstraction in your head. A module, you should be able to understand at the level of abstraction of a module what it does in its entirety. It shouldn't do one thing and a few other little things and maybe some utility bits. It should do one thing, single responsibility principle, single reason to change. As you scale up to a microservice, that should have a single reason to change. It should be small enough to fit in my head. As you scale up to systems of microservices, they, the system should fit in my head. 
So this is from class or function, depending on the language you're in, up through, uh, up through module, up through namespace, all the way up. As you chunk up these abstractions, they should follow the single responsibility principle. So I think we're good with that one. Next one is uh, KISS. People, who's hands up? KISS. Yes, most people are awesome. I suppose we are on a software uh, craftsmanship track. Keep it simple, stupid. And there's been an interesting shift. I was chatting with some of the people at Oracle about this. Um, an interesting shift recently, and we've noticed this inside ThoughtWorks. In fact, we've probably been driving parts of it. And in last year's Tech Radar, we put, to the horror of many, application servers on hold. So if you're thinking the you know, Tomcats, your web spheres, all these things, right? Big application servers that you deploy your software into and that they, they will execute all and run it for you. And that generally provide a whole bunch of gubbings around the outside, like, like some you know, transaction management, maybe some JMS uh, connections, all this sort of stuff, right? And there's been this movement away from that, from having one big box with an application server with many applications in it to essentially lots and lots and lots of small boxes with single applications in the microservices. Why is that? Because they're really complicated for a start, right? They massively slow down the feedback loop as you go through it, right? You have to compile, you have to deploy a thing, you have to install it into the server. Maybe it'll pick up the changes, maybe it won't. Oh, have you, have you, like, have you, have you used the extensions of WebSphere that you have to bind in because that is the only way it's called to spring? All this stuff, you don't need it, right? You can use it just simple embedded tools. Keep it simple, stupid. And in the back of my mind, actually, what I have is, is this, WWJD. This is what I have in the back of my mind. And this, this stands for, what would Joe do? I appreciate not everyone in the room will know who Joe Warns is. But Joe Warns is I, he's probably the best developer I've, I've ever worked with. It's a myth that you get these 10 times productivity people, it, apart from Joe, <laughs> essentially, right? Um, he's astonishingly productive. Um, and his, his gift, real gift, is to see, um, to see simplicity in software. So as an example, do we need an application server, right? Um, I've written a small application. Uh, it needs to do some, maybe some WebSocket stuff, communicate with a web page to show some dashboard stuff. What would Joe do? Well, I'll tell you what Joe would do. He'd do this, because this is what he did. He went and built Webit, which is probably about 200 lines of code. It's a HTTP server that does WebSockets, and that's it, right? That's all it does. Really, really simple. He didn't need the rest. He didn't even need an embedded web server. He just needed 200 lines of code that did exactly what he wanted to do. Keep it simple. Here's another example of this. So this is at a, from a, a project I was on some time back. We were struggling with the question, OK, we've got all these services. Uh, right, and we need to work out you know, do service discovery. We need to understand what's deployed where, what versions, and all this kind of stuff. Okay, well, we need to right, we need to deploy console, but console needs a classic search interface and all this stuff. Right, we need all this stuff. It's take us three months to do, get it all ready, production hardened, etc. What would Joe do though? What, what what Joe would do is he'd use something like that stack and just build something really straightforward that took two days, and then we had a view of our production UAT. QA infrastructure. And actually, this is a GIF of it doing, um, of a, of a blue-green deploy. So each of those boxes is a Phoenix, in, uh, Phoenix cluster, essentially. So we deploy a service in either three or six, no, on either three or six nodes. We'd create the nodes, add them into a load balancer. The load balancer would register with the, um, the load balancers one tier above it. And then when it came time to, um, to, to actually uh, move versions, so, you know, have production be the new version, we would hit the button and it would swap DNS. And that's essentially what's happening there. So as they move from, from green to blue, we're swapping versions. And this is, you know, this is like, this was on a, I think this is cron, cron job every minute, produced a PNG which was symlinked into uh, a directory which Nginx could serve up. And you could just go and have a look, see what our production infrastructure is doing. So that brings me to, you know, KISS, right? So I'd say, you know, do the simplest thing we possibly can. Do the simplest thing. Keep it simple, even when you're faced with complexity. So I think KISS actually still applies. <laughs> what about things like, i have to start wrapping up now. Things like CD, continuous delivery. What are the lessons we can take from that? How can we use things like continuous delivery to help with our problems with what I talked about earlier, end-to-end -end testing, product-level testing, integration testing? 
Are there things we can do? Well, actually, yes, there's a bunch of patterns we can use, right? Which I'm going to group under into that same category. So the first one would be semantic monitoring in production. Actually firing off things like synthetic transactions, right? Being able to recognize uh, like synthetic transactions hitting your production systems. I've been on quite a few places now where you, you, know, you just have tests that run user journeys in production the whole time with fake users. I know of a, um, I saw a talk by, he's actually on my track in Amsterdam. Um, he's at a, a new bank called Getmondo. And what they're doing, you know, they have synthetic transactions which are real bank accounts. So they'll deposit real money into a fake account. Uh, they'll then transfer it into another fake account. Uh, at the end of the day, they'll still clear and sweep the money back. You know, this is synthetic transactions in banking. So you, we can do this in production, right? And if we've got a good monitoring and we're able to remediate problems fast, which is essentially what deploy and demand gives us, push button, let's get stuff out, um, then we can take advantage of things like semantic, uh, semantic monitoring. Another, uh, another technique we can use, which um, I think the, the talk after this one is on, I think, which is essentially contract testing or consumer-driven contracts. And what you do with consumer-driven contracts is uh, one service tells a service it depends on what it expects, what its behavior should be with respect to it. So that's a bit confusing. So essentially, it's like mocking but for services. But the key thing is you hand the expectations over to uh, the dependent service, and they run them as part of their build. So they actually execute. Uh, uh, they, they have executable contracts that they can that they can they can run. So they know that team knows if they break uh, those contracts, if those tests fail, that they've broken some of their upstream consumers. As I say, I'm going to move over this as this entire talk that will really explain this much much better than I am at the moment. So, but essentially, you write some expe expectations, uh, you give it to another team, and they run it as part of their build. This is consumer driven contracts. So can these things sort of help with this mess, right? The mess we described at the start, this kind of, we've got microservices up a tree a bit with this, right? This kind of awful, and you know, add 600 more services onto this. That's gonna look pretty grim. Can it help with that? And I think it can. I think we can get rid of this, this mess, right? We don't have to do this fanning. And if you look at some of these big companies, this is exactly what they're doing. What they're doing essentially they have completely independent build pipelines, right? And when they're pushing software through straight into production, they rely on really good monitoring. And I mean, with, you know, I want to know within 10 seconds whether I've got a problem on any of one of my 10,000 deployed instances of, of my services within 10 seconds, right? I want to be able to trace those problems back to the service and the node that's causing those problems. I, I want to be able to do that really fast. They rely on things like um, fast remediation. I can get stuff out. I can roll forward or roll back probably forward really, really fast. And actually, things like containers, so things like Docker, um, the stuff from the Mesosphere folk, is starting to bring this actually more into the mainstream. And they rely on things like QAing in production. Get stuff out there, right? And your QAs can test it in production. How scary is that? <laughs> but this is what people are doing. This is what big, big organizations are doing. And so really what I'm saying <clears throat> is that we should be looking at the death of integration environments, right? We shouldn't need these things anymore. We shouldn't need to be deploying into some weird combination of snapshot this and version production version that type thing anymore. But we have to get good at the other stuff, the stuff that's around it, uh, in order to help us do that. And this is a key thing. I talked about QAs in production. Production doesn't equal live, right? And this is something I think is only becoming apparent as we move away from having our own data centers where we've got a limited amount of kit Right? Production is live. If we put it into the production data center, it's live. People see it. We've got, we've got the ability now to do all sorts of cool stuff. Canary releasing. We can do A-B testing. And essentially, only when a service is experiencing real live traffic from consumers is it actually live. Right? So you can deploy something into production. doesn't make it live. Deploy something into production. Your QAs can test it. Your product managers and product owners can look at it. Developers can make sure it's working. Can look at the really good monitoring uh, to see whether it's working in production. And then you can flip it to live. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do. Anyway, I should move on because I'm about to hit time. I did say the future is scary, right? I think it is, right? For a lot of big companies, the future is scary. And for this reason, because if you're not doing this stuff I've been talking about, deploying into production, sorry, um, testing in production, um, taking advantage of things like fully on-demand continuous delivery, uh, sorry, continuous deployment, and using continuous delivery whole team, 
then you're falling rapidly behind, rapidly behind. And soon you won't be able to get back. And this is true even in finance. And people say, oh, you know, we're a unicorn, we're finance, no one can take us on, right? But if you think about, we've got, there's Google Wallet, this is Mondo, Atom, Apple Pay, those two in the middle, they've just got banking licenses from the Bank of England. New digital banks built with uh, Golang, for example, in terms of Get Mondo, full continuous delivery, doing the synthetic transaction stuff, just awesome. So even, even if you're in finance, or government, wherever it is, this is starting to become an issue. But it's not, it's not easy, as I say, right? There's some issues. We have to learn how to do this stuff, craft my family's acts, build these systems, what, you know, understand the, the wider implications of what we know currently as an industry. We need, need, to, need to work out how to do this deployment thing. And we need to be able to do this testing in isolation and probably in production. But saying that, I think the future is quite bright. As an example of this, I'm a technological optimist. This is one of my favorite graphs. So where, where are we now? About 2010. This is, this is kind of a logarithmic, a logarithmic plot of Moore's law, right? but normalized for the amount of compute you can get for $1,000. Right? So for $1,000, you can see up here we've got one insect brain, mouse brain, human brain, all human brains. By about, if this follows, I think it's about 2040, for $1,000, you'll be able to get the same amount of compute as currently exists in all human brains on the planet for 1000 bucks. It's not bad, is it? Future's bright, right? It's cool. Plus, we can do all this stuff, right? All this stuff still works. We just need to chunk up and down levels of abstraction. We can still rely on the principles, the practices uh, that we know and love, the, the better practices for software engineering, SRP graphs, etc. And we can take advantage of new advances. I haven't got containers up here, but things like that, right? Consumer-driven contracts, semantic versioning, semantic monitoring, testing and production, things like failure isolation. I'm going to finish by saying, you know, that's cool. I, for one, welcome our new uh, overlords. Thank you very much.